It is great to see everyone here today. Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Um, let's learn a lesson. When you stand up here and speak with a microphone, make sure if you're going to say something about someone that they don't get the microphone next. <laughs> um, and as everyone knows, apple pie wins. So, well, we had a great Thanksgiving. We had um, seven, seven grandkids and three dogs running around the house. Um, for several days, and uh, great is our reward in heaven. Um, so, um, what are we about to do here? I think it's good to remember, why, why do we do sermons? Why do we do this sort of thing? We believe, we are convinced that the Bible is God's word to us, that it is his revelation of who he is and how he relates to us and how he calls us to relate to him and to one another in light of who he is. And so it is important for us to gather together as his followers and to understand what it is that God's word says to us. And then how do we respond to that in how we live? Now, as you've already seen reference to multiple times, we are focusing on Advent Conspiracy uh, over the next several weeks. Advent Conspiracy has been around for about 10 years, and what this does is it challenges churches, it challenges Christians to rethink a little bit how they actually spend their resources, especially their money, over the Christmas season, and, well, that's interesting. Um, it, we are taking up that challenge. We are entering into that discussion over how we as a church, how we as a gathering of Christians could think about the resources that God has given us and how do we use them to reflect his character into our society. Now, originally, as I shared last week, there are um, Advent Conspiracy started when a church did some research and found that Americans spend, and this was 10 years ago, $450 billion a year on Christmas. And at that time, you could permanently solve the world's need for fresh water for about $10 billion, permanently solve it. So the thinking was, maybe our priorities are a little bit out of line. Maybe we could give up a little bit of what we are spending and use it to share with others. But what we are doing this year is we are focusing on um, not so much the global issue of fresh water, but the needs that are right here within our own community. And if you've noticed in the lobby over to my left, there's a table that is full of all kinds of cool stuff. And behind that cool stuff are cool pictures of kids. What is that? That represents children and families in our community that are involved in adoption, foster care, caring for orphans, caring for children who are in need. And there are five different organizations that are represented there, which are five different ways you can get involved. And every one of these organizations not only needs financial support, but they need volunteer support. Let me just run through who some of these organizations are, through all, who all of them are. We are encouraging you to get involved with Legacy Closet. Legacy Closet is an organization. We actually house Legacy Closet right here on this campus. It, it provides 
different types of needs, physical needs for children and family who are part of the adoption or foster care process. So if, if, a, if a child is, a foster child is brought into a home, that, that home immediately has needs for clothes, potentially diapers. They might need a, a changing bed, things like that. And this is an organization that collects these and then provides them for these families. There's an organization called Christmas for the Least of These, and they provide Christmas gifts to foster children and their families. And if you go to that desk right now, and I want to make sure I get this right, um, there are ornaments that you can pick up there that would help kind of clue you into what some of the presents are that the kids would need. Micah, how did I do? Okay, so, um, so we actually have two sets of ornaments going on this, this morning. We have ornaments at the South Ward Elementary Trees, and that is for to support uh, kids at South Ward Elementary School, many of whom will not receive a single Christmas gift other than what we provide. And so we are trying to provide a Christmas for them at some level and use it as an opportunity to share the gospel. And then we have the Christmas for the least of these, which has a very similar, but it's a slightly different way of approaching it at that desk. Also at that desk is Hannah House Maternity Home. This cares for pregnant women who are in crisis. It offers counseling for them and life skills to help them care for their newborn children when their children are born. Weighted Blanket Sewing Ministry makes blankets for foster and adopted children in East, in East Texas. These are incredibly important because they are tangible representations of love and support. And they provide a tremendous amount of emotional support to the children who receive them. And then finally, we have Beds of Hope, and this provides beds for East Texas children and families who are, are part of the CPS care process. And again, if a child is brought into a home in an emergency situation, very often what they need are beds. And the people who work with this organization who volunteer will actually build the beds, we store them, and then when the beds are needed, we provide them for them. And it's not just the bed frames, or it's really a whole part of the bed. And what I read, they even provide like a teddy bear with it. So I'm kind of hoping I can get involved at some point and um, get a score a teddy bear. Um, these are great organizations. And what we are challenging you to do is to think about in all of the money that you are going to spend this year at Christmas, is there a part of that money that can be set aside to provide for children and families who are stepping into life's messiest situations, who are truly very needy, and is there a way that you can be a blessing? That's the challenge. So let's go from the extremely important to the ridiculous. Um, oh, that's interesting that that is working backwards today. We'll do, the, we'll do this manually. Who here remembers this show? Fantasy Island. Remember the premise of this show? The premise of this show is a plane, small plane full of people where the land on this island they had usually paid for or they had won a trip to Fantasy Island. They would get off this plane and the idea is they would, they would come here and all of, well, their fantasy, their dream would come true. And it would be all kinds of dreams. You would have stories of people who um, wanted to be reunited with someone from their past that they hadn't seen in years. It might be someone who was in love with someone else and they, they wanted that person to fall in love with them. Or it might be someone who wanted to experience wealth or career success. You actually had one episode where there was someone who was trying to gain the love of a lost parent. And so they had a chance to, to experience that through Fantasy Island. Now, this may be old news to everyone else, but I didn't realize this. Did you know that Fantasy Island is being remade? It's going to be a movie, and I'm not meaning to provide advertising here, but Valentine's Day 2020. And if you are familiar with these movies, notice it says from the producers of Get Out and Halloween. Here's what's interesting. The Fantasy Island movie is going to be a horror movie. 
Now, that sounds weird. But you have to go back and think carefully about the TV show to understand that there really is a connection. You see, in the TV show, things did not always turn out well for people. Things did not always turn out the way they expected. In fact, things almost never turned out the way they expected. Sometimes people would show up on the island thinking that it was about their dream, their fantasy. But in reality, they were there to play a part in someone else's dream or fantasy, and they didn't know it. In almost every episode, this constant theme through the series... Someone would show up on the island and say, this is my dream. This is what I want. This is what I desire deeply. And by the end of the show, they would discover that wasn't their dream at all. It might be that that they wanted desperately for someone in their life to fall in love with them. But when they actually experience that, they realize this person is not at all who they thought they were. They might have desperately wanted to have career success in a certain field or fame or fortune. And when they got it, they realized that's not what they wanted at all. And very often what would happen in the episode is there would be this moment of crisis where the person has to choose between this is what you came here saying your dream was, is do you really want this? And very often the person would say, no, I've got to walk away. Or sometimes they would say yes to their own peril. What they needed was a jolt to realize that what they thought they wanted isn't what they needed or wanted at all. And that takes us to Christmas. Because Christmas often is that kind of a jolt. We create wish lists and we create shopping lists. And often, by the end of Christmas, we discover that what we really want isn't in any of those lists at all. And last week, we talked about worshiping fully. We talked about we need to make Christmas not just a celebration. We need to make it an act of worship We need to make this an occasion to remember the goodness of God's character and the greatness of God's majesty and power that is at work for us. This week is going to be a follow-up to that because one of the things that we tend to put in place of our God is our object of worship are the possessions that we give or receive at Christmas. And this week is going to change to spend less. And it's going to cause us to come face to face with a fantasy island moment where we say, what do we really want when it comes to Christmas? Now, the context of today's passage is the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount fundamentally is about what does it look like to live under God's rule? And when we come to to chapter 6, and we're going to do verses 19 through 24... We are entering a section where Jesus talks about what does it mean to live under God's rule with respect to wealth and possessions. And as you will see as we read through this, really the key question is what do you really want? So let's read through this passage. And then we're going to step back and go through this passage in detail step by step. Jesus is preaching and he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where the thieves, or where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. For no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. 
Basically, what Jesus does here is he sets out three different contrasts to emphasize how we need to think of money or where we need to put money in our lives. And he starts with the contrast between two different treasures. Actually, what we're going to see is really two different storehouses for treasures. And then he goes to this very strange sort of contrast between two different eyes or two different conditions for the eye. And then finally, he's going to talk about two different masters. It's a, it's a verse that we're very familiar with. But we have to understand it in its context that he is actually doing a series of three different contrasts. And the first one in verses 19 to 21 is a contrast between two different treasures. And what I'm going to suggest is this is really answering the question of where. Uh, this is... My son and me, we are about to be attacked by a large silver grizzly. Um, took this two days ago. Yeah, two days ago. Um, we grabbed coffee at Silver Grizzly. Patrick is, uh, lived, many of you know him. He lived here for a long time, was on staff with Missionary Tech Team. And a year ago, he and his family moved to Wisconsin, uh, which they enjoy despite the craziness of the weather. Um, but in talking to him, it became clear that as much as he loves Wisconsin, Longview is still home. There's a way of doing things here that just feels comfortable. There's a way of thinking. There's a way of relating. He's in Wisconsin. He loves Wisconsin. But even in Wisconsin, he's thinking about life at home. Have you ever felt that way? Thinking about what life is at home. And that is really what Jesus is getting at in these verses. Where do you think of? What place draws your attention? What place shapes your thinking? What place shapes how you're relating? Because it's either going to be life on earth or it's going to be life in heaven. So let's look at how Jesus develops this in these verses. Now, the first thing to notice is he's really talking about where you lay up your treasure, the word lay up literally means to store something. And that's going to be the key differences in, his tre in, in what he's talking about. And he shows the significance of this in verse 21. For where your treasure is, wherever you lay it up, wherever you store it, that is where your heart will be also. In other words, what he's saying is whatever you, you value the most, whatever you desire the most. If you got off that plane on Fantasy Island and said, this is what I want, wherever that treasure is located, that is where your heart, which was a way of saying your core of who you are, your whole person, that is where your heart is going to be set. That is how your life is going to be oriented. Whatever you value most, wherever that is, that's how your life is going to be oriented. And so the key is, where do you store? Where do you lay up your treasures? And there are two possible places. It's either on earth or it's in, an, it's in heaven. Treasure on earth, they would have known exactly what Jesus was talking about. In their day, treasure consisted of, very often, expensive cloth. Expensive cloth literally could be willed from one generation to the next. And that was a way that both could show your wealth and preserve your wealth. The other thing that was extremely important was precious metal. And so when Jesus talks about where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, these were very real fears to them. They, this was not theoretical because since they relied so heavily on cloth to preserve their wealth and preserve their possessions, the threat of moths was very real. And because they relied so much on precious metal, the threat of rust and the threat of stealing was very real. And so very often what people would do to store their treasures, to lay up their treasures, they would put the cloth in boxes to try to protect it from moths. And they would dig a hole and hide their precious metal. 
the threats that are here, the moth, the rust, the thieves, were every bit as vivid and real to them as if Jesus were to say to us, where the stock market might crash, where unexpected medical bills that are not covered by insurance might absolutely wipe you out, or where identity theft might take everything that you have. It's that level of destruction that he's talking about. In fact, when he uses the word destroys, he's using an extremely strong word that means absolute destruction or complete ruin. But this is contrasted with verse 20. If you lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, then those things that were threats to wipe you out, to absolutely destroy you, cannot touch you. So you've got to ask the question, what are the treasures in heaven? The treasures on earth are these physical, tangible things that we can lock away and try to preserve wealth and try to preserve income and try to preserve our possessions. What are the treasures of heaven? The treasures of heaven are the things that reflect the character of God. The treasures of heaven are, are wanting the things that God wants. It's desiring to know God better and coming to know God better. The treasure of heaven is seeing God's character reflected in your life. And it's seeing the things that are important to God happen around you. Things like justice and care for the needy. And most importantly, the spread of the good news of the gospel. These are the things that heaven treasures. And Jesus' point is that they are not subject they are to, to moths and rust and thieves. These are not things that can be taken from you. They are eternal and they are secure. Jesus would challenge us. If you could look accurately and honestly at yourself and know what you would really want if you stepped off that plane on Fantasy Island, would it be something that is temporary, that is tied to boxes and a hole on earth, or to be something that is eternal and secure? Well, how do you know? How do you evaluate that in your life? You need to pay attention to where you go looking for your treasure. What is the picture of what makes life a good life? Is it your possessions? Is it wealth? Is it financial comfort and security? Or is the picture of your good life a life that knows God better every day? A life that goes through the hard times and the good times of life with God. A life that reflects his character regardless of the circumstances. And if your picture of the good life is tied to financial position, you will be a slave. You will be tied to the circumstances of your life. And if your picture of the good life is based on your spiritual condition, then you will look to your relationship with the Lord. And that is where you will find the good life. Jesus starts this passage, he starts this section on possessions by saying there are two different places you can store your treasure, earth or heaven. And depending on where you store them is, the type of, is going to determine the type of treasure they are. Is it a type of treasure that is temporary? Is it a type of treasure that is insecure? Or is it a treasure that is tied to the very character of God and relationship with him that can be lived out in your life regardless of circumstances, regardless of moth or rust or thieves? Then Jesus gives this very, very strange analogy of two eyes, or an eye that's healthy and an eye that's not. And I think what Jesus is doing here is instead of answering the question of where you store your treasure, he's answering the question of why. Why is it important that you center your life on what is the treasures of heaven instead of the treasures of earth. Now, biblical scholars are actually kind of confused about this, but I think saying that this answers the question of why helps it make a lot of sense. You see, if we ended our study of this passage at verse 21, 
then what we would conclude is the reason you wanted to store your treasures of heaven is because that's a better investment. Because that has a longer term payoff. And that's okay. But I think what we see in these verses, in verses 22 and 23, is that it's not just about what happens tomorrow. It's about what is happening into our life, in our lives right now. Now, it's important to remember that Jesus is not giving an anatomy lesson here. He's teaching spiritual truth. And so you have these concepts of, of light and darkness. And light stands for what is good and righteous, what is like God, what is like his character. Darkness stands for what is morally evil, what is wrong, what is against God's character. And Jesus' point is that what you are focused on is going to fill your spiritual condition with either light or darkness. Now, here's what's really interesting is this word healthy. The word healthy literally means singleness of purpose or wholeness. The idea of, of being completely dedicated to someone. So the idea is, what is your eye wholly dedicated to? What is your eye taking in? What is your focus? Jesus is saying that what you focus on is going to shape the person you are becoming. The person you are becoming is determined by what your life is dedicated to. There is a very classic Christmas example of that that we all know of, that we repeat every year. Who is this guy? Scrooge. You remember the story of Scrooge? Scrooge didn't start off as Scrooge. Well, that was his name. But he didn't start off as the character that he became by the end. You see, his love of possessions, his love of money, cost him a wonderful, wonderful fiancé that he had that would have brought so much joy to his life. But he could never make her enough of a priority. And then it cost him friendships. And then it cost him eventually every single relationship around him until he got to the point that he no longer valued relationships at all. He became a person who valued only what he possessed. And he became a person who inside was deeply, deeply twisted. That's the sort of thing that Jesus is talking about here. His eye was focused solely on what it is that he could possess. And over time, that filled him with a darkness that cost him everything around him. Now, Scrooge is an extreme example. But the fact is we see this around us all the time, and we wonderfully see it at Christmas. When I was little, I remember this very clearly. There were two sisters who were in my family. They were not my sisters. It's the only child. That's why I'm the way I am. Um, but as part of the extended family, there were these two sisters. And I can remember very vividly being in multiple conversations with them, where the point of the conversation was, look at who was given what at Christmas between the two sisters and which one was loved more by the parents. They used what they were given as a scorecard for how they were loved. One year, the younger sister wanted a horse, and she got it. Can you imagine the effect that had on her older sister? Can you imagine how long that horse actually filled that hole in her? to know and believe that she was actually loved by her parents. By the next time I visited that family, which was probably three or four months after the fact, the horse was an afterthought. You see, if you are looking to your possessions, 
to be to, for proof, for evidence of how you are loved. It is going to corrupt you. The desire to be loved is good and holy and righteous. It is built into us. But when we look at the treasures of earth to provide that for us, it is going to corrupt us. But what about the other side of the Christmas experience? Anyone here ever been part of a No, you're not part of the family. You're not part of it. You have witnessed the competitive gift giving. You know what I'm talking about? Gift giving turns into a sport. And the question is, who can give the best gift? Why? Because I want to be loved the most. We have another, our family, you're just going to think, I come from this a highly dysfunctional background. Um, we have someone in our family who is extremely over the top, beyond imagination, insecure as a gift giver. She's actually a very good gift giver. She does a great job. But at Christmas, when you get a gift from her, it will immediately be followed up, I mean, as soon as you open this gift, with a list of apologies for why this probably wasn't the gift that you wanted. And then she will start asking, and she will ask for days, are you happy with the gift? Did you like the gift? What do you think of the gift? Was the gift good enough for you? Are you sure it was the right gift? Because if it wasn't, I'll, I'll take it back for you. You see, what is at stake for her is that in that gift, she is trying to buy our love. And her fear is that if we do not accept the gift, we will not accept her. And what she ends up doing is driving people away. Her desire to be loved is good, but getting it through having treasures on earth, even in what you give in those treasures on earth will ultimately corrupt you. And that is Jesus' point. If our focus, if our aim, if our desire, if the answer to what we would say when we got off the plane on Fantasy Island is anything about the treasures of earth, what we would own, what we could physically possess, what we could physically give away, if that is what we define as the good life, if that is our focus, it is is going to corrupt us. Then Jesus sums up the whole passage in one of his most famous statements, one of the most famous verses in the Bible. Verse 24. Two treasures, two eyes, then two masters. And he doesn't describe the masters. He simply points out that if you have two masters, it's going to create a problem. And so the question that has to be answered is a question of whom. Whom will you serve? You see, no one can serve two masters. What's interesting is that in that culture, there were cases where people had two masters. But here's how what you have to remember. If you were a slave, and by the way, let's not skip the fact that Jesus is putting us in the slave role. Um, if you were a slave, you were completely owned by your master. You had absolutely no individual rights. You had no individual freedom. There was no such thing as free time. No time was your own time. And if that's the case, and you try to have two masters, you see the conflict. How can my time be totally dedicated to this one master when all of a sudden this other master shows up and says that I need you. You have to choose between the two. And it did in that culture create all kinds of problems. And so Jesus is talking about something that they would have known about. You can't really serve two masters. Because you're going to be dedicated to one at the expense of the other. But notice that Jesus doesn't say dedicated to the one at the expense of the other. He uses really strong language. You will hate the one and love the other. You will be devoted to the one 
and despise the other. Why does he use such strong language? I think it's because he's talking about wealth and God. And wealth and God are masters that demand exactly opposite things. If you are going to make wealth and possession your master, your life is going to be a life that is centered on self and selfishness. And if you are going to make God your master, your life is going to be centered on selflessness. And this is one of the ways that Advent conspiracy dramatically impacts us. You see, when we encourage you to spend less, what we are asking you to do is to reduce your Christmas budget this year. Reduce how much you're going to spend on gifts, how much you're going to spend on decorations, food, and so forth. And so if you came into the Christmas season, and let's just say this to make the math easy, that you're going to spend $1,000 on all of Christmas for all your family, all decorations, all food, everything. That was your budget. What we're saying is, could you spend 800 and take the 200 that's left over and give it out here to one of these organizations? Here's what you're going to be tempted to do. And the, the, the people on both sides of me, the youth, are counting on you doing this. I'm not meaning to pick on you. We all kind of in our hearts are counting on this. What we are saying is, what we will be tempted to do is to say, you know what, let me go ahead and spend the $1,000 on Christmas and we'll just do an extra 200. That's very generous. But do you understand that that misses the point? You see what we're trying to do? What we are trying to do is put ourselves in a position where what gets bubbled up in our lives is what our master really is. What do we really want? And so we have to ask ourselves, how does it impact us as gift givers? If we say, I am going to give less. Does it hurt our pride? Do we feel bad when we talk to other moms about what their Christmas experience was like? Do we feel like we are less of a provider for our family to the degree that we answer those questions? Yes, is to the degree that we must consider that maybe, maybe our treasure, at least in part, is on earth. How will it impact us as a gift receiver? If our family decides to do that, and by the way, family, if you decide to do that, don't blindside your kids. Bring them into the process so they can learn from this process and be a part and buy into this process. But if your family does that, are you going to feel cheated? Are you going to feel less loved? Are you going to compare yourselves to others? And if the answer to that question is yes, then maybe that's bubbling to the surface that your master... Your treasure is more tied to earth than it is to heaven. So you see, the idea is to actually spend less. We're not just trying to help these ministries. We are doing something that the Lord uses to change us, to help us replace a master who is a tyrant, the master of wealth and possessions, and replace that master with a master who loves us. So you realize what we're doing. We are unwrapping the question of what you really want for Christmas. It's not the stuff that goes on your Amazon wish list. It's not the stuff that goes on your shopping list. I'm talking about the real wants that you're trying to get through those lists. Those deep down under the surface, proof that I am loved, proof that I'm important, Proof that I'm worthy of respect. Proof that I'm not a failure. Proof that I belong. All of those things tend to operate beneath the surface. 
of our giving and receiving gifts and the money that we spend on Christmas. And as much as we say that Jesus is the reason for the season, we have an extremely hard time not making Christmas a scorecard on life. If we take Jesus' words seriously in Matthew 6, we need to pay attention to what is going on inside of us when we give and receive at Christmas. Do you see the signs of where your treasure is stored? If your treasure is stored on earth, then what you give and receive will be a measure of your value in some way. If your treasure is stored in heaven, then what you give and receive becomes opportunities to reflect his character, to focus on becoming like him and doing what is important in his eyes. What is the focus that you have as you give and receive? If our focus is on reflecting God's character and worshiping him and being grateful for his blessings, then Christmas will be used by God to transform us to be like him. But if our focus is on how we benefit from giving and receiving, it will erode us, it will corrupt us because possessions will have become our master. And that's the point that Jesus is making here. Do not allow your possessions to be your master. Christmas, like Fantasy Island, is one of those times that we come face to face with the question of what do we really want? Not what we say we want, not what operates on our wish list and our shopping lists, but what we really want underneath. And that is going to be especially true if you take up Advent conspiracy and decide that possessions, money, spending is going to have less of a role in your Christmas. You're going to discover a little bit more of how much of your treasure is actually on earth how much of your focus has actually been darkened and how much you are a slave to what you own. Breaking that slavery involves breaking your dependence on that master and becoming more dependent on the master who is your savior. So how do we respond? Well, there are several ways. And again, if you're new to the church, we provide you with this bulletin. On the back of the bulletin is a place where you can respond to the message. It says, my next step today is. And we encourage you to fill those out. And there are actually drop boxes in the foyer for those that um, we collect those as a staff. And we as a staff pray for them. We join you in prayer as you are seeking to apply God's word. So if you're new here, if you've been here for years and years, we encourage you to use those. So how do you respond? Well, again, I would encourage you, as we do so often, to take this passage that we've studied and rewrite it because it will help you wrestle with it in a very personal and deep way. Spend time in prayer. Ask the Holy Spirit to show where you have been storing up treasure on earth. Invite someone to join you in supporting Advent Conspiracy. This is actually one of the really, really cool things that you can do. Don't just enjoy do this by yourself. Involve other families. Come together maybe as a small group or as a life group and say, how can we do this together? And then actually do it. Make the amount that you will reduce your spending enough that it affects you. It affects you spiritually that it affects your expectations and that it surfaces what is it that you really want and love. And we are providing ways that you can do that right here, either by supporting South Ward or getting involved in Advent Conspiracy. If you are someone here and you are just starting your spiritual journey or you don't really know who Christ is or what he's about, the most important thing that you can do, the most important next step for you to take is to get to know the gift of Jesus that we celebrate at Christmas. And there are ways that you can do that. If you write that on that, on that response card, 
If you come talk to any of the folks who are going to be down here as we close in prayer, let us help you take that next step. But if you are someone who is a Christian, who is wanting to walk with the Lord, then the next step for you is to bubble up where is your treasure truly stored? What does your eye focus on? Who is your master? You need to bubble that up. And one of the best ways to do that is to actually take away some of the possessions that you would normally depend on and give it to others. I want to um, invite the prayer team to come forward. Why do we need to end in prayer? We need to end in prayer because what is natural for us is to look at what we own and what we possess and say that is the source of my security and my significance in life. What is not natural for us is to say I will give those things away because I trust the Lord. And for us to make that change requires the power of the Lord working in us and through us and that's why I want us to stand and close is to ask for that power. So could you stand with me and let's close in prayer team if you could join me up front. And at the end of the service, if there is anything that you need to pray about, we want to join you in prayer and support you in that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are reminded that your love for us was sacrificial, sacrificial to the point of sending your son to die for us when we were your enemies so that we could be restored in relationship with you. So often, Lord, we are so deeply wired to be self-centered, to be sacrificially loving to others is very hard. And so often, Lord, because of the sin that operates in us, we look to things other than you to be the source of our comfort and strength and security. And very often what we look to are the things in this world that can be destroyed by moth and rust and thieves. Lord, forgive us for that. Help us to store our treasure in heaven with the things of God and the character of God and the person of God at work in our lives. Lord, help us to rest our treasure there and to value what you are doing in us and through us as the greatest treasure that we could ever receive. And Lord, if we truly can do that, then giving is not quite as painful. We ask that you would do that work in us even today. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So here's what we've said today about God. We have said this. The treasure that is found in him is eternal and it is secure. So the challenge is to leave here and place your treasure in him and not in what is insecure and temporary. You are dismissed. <laughs>